Welcome to the Give Me Liberty podcast of the Standing for Freedom Center right here at Liberty University, where we defend life, liberty, and truth to ensure the foundations of freedom exist for the next generation. And my guest today is editor-in-chief of Clear Truth Media. He's associate pastor of Hope Church, Craig Gavin. I hope that I have that right. Craig, Craig Nailed Gavin. It. Thank you. Perfect. Jamie Bambrick, the one and only Thank you for joining the Give Me Liberty podcast, Jamie. Welcome. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. And great to be with someone else who also has a difficult to pronounce surname because everybody gets mine wrong. You've got it just right, which I am very impressed by. So (laughs) yeah, well done. I had a background in Greek, in German, Hebrew, Spanish. What else? What other language? French. So, you know, I've had these languages. Irish Irish would help, but there you go. Not that it's particularly Irish, actually. Yeah, there you go. So do you know any Gaelic jokes? I think that's some, that's why I had you on. No yeah, Gaelic no, jokes? Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm from the Protestant half of the community, so it's pretty much a cultural no-go to learn any Gaelic. Uh, quite, quite seriously, it is like very frowned upon. Uh, so we didn't grow up learning any of that. The Catholic half of the community all learn it. Um, uh, the Protestant half of Northern Ireland are, are not uh, really socially permitted to do so. So I know, I know, I know like, Five that's, phrases. And that's that's, that's frowned upon in the Protestant. So so that when you speak with the tongues of angels, what is that tongue then, Jamie, in, in Ireland? What is the tongues of angels? Well, I mean, I speak English, so I don't know if it's quite the tongues of the angels. What I will say is this. The English may have invented our language, but we perfected it. Um, <laughs> I think our, our terms of phrase and our accent, I think, really is, is as good as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, I, you know, mm. I, I can't disagree with you because I, you know, growing up in America, it's like, man, we just get so used to just, you know, the average American speak. And uh, it's always fun, you know, uh, to to have a guest uh, from across the pond to come on and enlighten right. us. So you already you're like you're bowling with like a plus 20 right now because because, you know, you have an accent. So we're going to pay yeah, closer attention to what you have to say. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely it definitely helps. Uh, it gives me a totally unwarranted sense of credibility, and I appreciate that. I will take all of it I can get. <laughs> well, I appreciate your work, what you're doing at Clear Truth Media. Um, <laughs> you're providing Christians with an alternative to legacy media. Um, we we think you know even now in terms of like legacy media, Christian legacy media. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about Clear Truth why you exist, what's your mission, why now? It's 2024, why now? Why start a new thing? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things that I think a lot of the church realized was over the course of 2020, which I think for many people was a very clarifying moment in their walks with God as to where their church were at, as to where their denominations were at. And one of the things people also realized was that a lot of the institutions that were putting in Con or putting out content that was feeding into a lot of churches and denominations, that they maybe weren't quite as um, conservative, certainly on cultural issues, as I think they needed to be, that maybe they had some uh, compromise or perhaps just blind spots. Um, neither are good. One of them is slightly more concerning than the other. But nonetheless, um, so, so if we look through you know, I, people. some people have picked this up a little bit earlier, um, but the likes of the Gospel Coalition or Christianity Today, when it came to some of those big issues, so if you take Black Lives Matter and critical race theory, if you take how churches responded to, say, the COVID, um, vaccine mandates, mask mandates, things like that. Um, or you can also look at some of the other issues that are boiling that weren't explicitly, you know, a 2020 issue, but you take sexuality, I think they seeded some ground there. Now, to be clear, when it comes to TDC, they, they would say that same-sex activity is sin. But nonetheless, they would be much more conciliatory on the idea of attraction. They would say that that's very much a you know something that can't be changed or transformed mm-hmm. um, and not something that people should uh, seek to walk in freedom from, right? And, uh, and, and so I think a lot of people realized that over that time period. And... What we sort of felt, uh, those of us that, that are involved in this and setting this up, um, was that there were a lot of wonderful individuals out there doing great work. A lot of people pushing back hard, a lot of people speaking with clarity and conviction, 
But what there wasn't, what didn't exist was a collective effort that could reach the broader church in the way that some of those institutions did. So we pulled together a whole bunch of, you know, contributors. Was it? We started off with a, a few people in a few conversations, and then we just went out to people that we kind of knew from Twitter or whatever it might be, right? And sort of went, mm-hmm. yeah, do you, know, you want to try and start something? And pretty much everybody that we spoke to was actually really excited about doing that. Um, so we've endeavored to build something that is relatively big tent, um, evangelical, you know, in its in its fundamental doctrine, but willing to to host different perspectives when it comes to say uh, more Calvinistic, more Arminian, when it comes to say more cessationist, more uh, continuationist, whatever it might be. Um, but but uh, solid on on all the the essentials uh, and agreed and all of that, strongly agreed on that, and unwilling to compromise on those. Um, but also people that have a history and a background of being strong on some of the cultural issues that are facing us. So guys that actually acquitted themselves well, and girls, uh, we've got some some female writers and they're wonderful, um, but people that have acquitted themselves well during that period that spoke up um, have, have showed a bit of courage. We had a Zoom call with, an, with uh, you know, some of our, our contributors and it was wonderful to see that most of them had been fired uh, at some point for standing for truth. And we're like, that's that's actually a really good sign. We like that. Yeah. And so so we, we kind of felt that these were people who who had a you know a history of paying a little bit of a price on some of the issues that are really facing us. And whilst we can't predict all of the issues that will face us down the road perfectly, we can nonetheless see someone's track record. That's a really good sign of how they're gonna react to things to come. And um, yeah, so so uh, the aim was to to build uh, a reliable resource for churches that would be a broad resource. That's one of our aims: is that we're not just trying to do sort of anti woke Christian stuff. As good as that is, we want to have that. That's really important. But we also want to be broader. We want to be a broader theological resource. Um, you know, aimed at the laity. We're not trying to be a theological journal, but aimed at, at you know your everyday believer and a useful resource for pastors as well. We're not trying to write though at a super high academic level. Very much trying to bring it down that it's accessible. Um, that but but that kind of resource is putting out content, so putting out uh, articles, yeah. putting out some video content, podcasts. We've got more stuff that we'd like to get out there um, over the next few weeks and months and we've got some plans in the works to do that um but yeah we, we're hoping that the, it's something that pastors or other believers can recommend to one another and they know that they're not going to get that perhaps 10 20 percent that exists in some of those other places that actually can lead towards some compromise on some of those key issues of the day so we want it to be one that that people are confident is going to be solid uh, and not going to shift and just go with the time. So that's that's our fundamental aim. That's why we felt we needed to do it. And uh, yeah, we just started in the 1st of July and it's been uh, a great few weeks since we started. It's been exciting. Yeah, there's been a number of notable articles that I've I've seen and I've even shared um, that y'all have already put out in just this, just this amount of time. So it's it, it truly incredible uh, what you guys are doing. I think that sky's the limit. I mean, you know, it's interesting, Jamie, it's like the more options you have, right, um, that are out there, the more interest or attention can get divided. But I also think it at the same time, it allows you to specialize in certain ways that other people can. It also let allows you to be a missional, missionally focused, you know, organization. I love what you said about the, the writers, uh, those that you're bringing in, you know, they've paid a price in some way or shape or form, you know, uh, for being courageous. Um, you know, I think, what's the Upton Sinclair quote? Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, so this is my paraphrase, but, you know, yeah. um, not, you know, don't underestimate somebody's ability to un- to understand uh, a situation when their paycheck doesn't allow them to, right? Right, um, yeah. Something along those lines. I, I know that's not the correct quote, but it's it's like that. And so, the, the reality is, is that people have various loyalties and oftentimes those loyal, loyalties, um, you know, can can arrest their attention and, and handcuff them to something where they can't speak out as boldly or speak the truth. Um, 
but there, you've had a number of articles and some great content that's already come out on Clear Truth, and I'm very appreciative of that. Anywhere there's courage, Thank you. I think it begets courage in others, right? And so, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, you are, you're there, um, you know, in, in our, you know, cousin country, I would say, United Kingdom, um, we, we, United States, our traditions, our heritage, our rule of law, um, our Protestant faith, all of that stems from England. I mean, when we talk about America being founded as a Christian nation, we have to be very specific. W what we're not talking about is the Vatican. We're not talking about, right. you know, the, the Italian peninsula. We're coming out of Spain or coming out of France. I mean, specifically, we're talking about Protestantism. Um, and we're talking about something that while it started in, say, you know, Germany, was Luther at Wittenberg, then it, you know, had other pockets, had other areas of it in Geneva and in the, the Dutch Netherlands. I mean, really so much of our legal tradition, our, our cultural heritage, all of that stems from uh, England. I mean, it's unmistakable, right? Um, and yeah. in, our, in our constitution, our Bill of Rights, all of that borrowed, borrowed. Um, so we're seeing in the United States this, this, um, this erosion, um, you know, this sort of uh, deconstruction, if you will, of law um, and really our common understanding that gives rise to, you know, freedom and inalienable rights. All of those things are necessary doctrines to support, um, um, you know, justice and the legal system and everything else. We, in the past, say, decade or so, uh, have allowed um, into the United States um, a massive amount of people who have, they're, 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 it's unmistakable. I don't care where you stand on immigration. Um, you can't argue uh, that this is not the case. This is absolutely the case. You can't ar argue otherwise that, that their way to come into the country is that they broke the law. Uh, so right. however they came, um, you know, for whatever their motivations for coming, let me put it that way, whatever their motivations might have been, um, if they were fleeing persecution, um, if they were being trafficked, if, um, you know, they're literally coming here, um, you know, to to commit violence or or to drug traffic or you name it, they all had to break the law to get here. Um, but it's it's not unlike some of the things you guys are experiencing over in the UK um, where something like 15% of your current population have not even been born there. And yeah. uh, when we say that, we're not talking about, oh, well, these, these are folks that are born in, you know, um, different parts of yeah. Western Europe, and they have this understanding of Western society and tradition and all of that. No, we're talking about folks that have been, been placed there from other parts of the world where there is even this diametric opposition, this tribal um, cultural, um, you know, you would say political and even religious um, understanding that is that is incompatible uh, with with uh, your society, um, and there is no process of naturalization whatsoever. So you go to pockets of the UK right now, and it's like you're entering into a foreign country. And I don't mean France and Germany; I mean a foreign country in another part of the world. Yeah. Um, it's, it's incredible. There is no way to sustain a multicultural society like that and not to have significant breakdowns in law and justice and societal cohesion, uh, peace and civility. There's no way to continue that. And that's part of the thing. You wrote an article about this, and that's why I wanted to have you on and kind of talk about this because I think it's insightful and it's a shared kind of thing because we're we're experiencing something like that in the United States. And I want to be very clear as I frame this conversation, I am not against immigration. I am not, um, uh, you know, uh, bigoted, hateful towards uh, foreigners and immigrants coming in through a lawful legal process. Uh, we are a nation founded uh, upon immigrants and those who came from other parts of the world. Um, and, uh, and and yes, you know, bring us your, your cold, your tired, your hungry, all of that. Uh, but we have to recognize that there was a process for hundreds of years of naturalization, that there is only one culture here. There's one 
common tongue, vernacular, language. Uh, there is only one legal system. Um, there are not two or three or 20. Um, there's not two sets of standards, uh, but one universal. But that's beginning to break down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, where, where do you start an issue like this? We could go back. Um, I, I think historically in the UK, we had a very stable level of uh, immigration for, for you know, most of the 1900s until Tony Blair, who advertised himself really as a moderate sort of center left figure, in reality was pretty far left. And he did many things. One of them was he flung open the borders. And uh, so, so I, I would distinguish a little bit. I, I do think legal or illegal migration, illegal migration is an issue. I, I think just migration is perhaps a better term, uh, mm. you know, righteous migration, because what we've seen in the UK is we have, you know, we have illegal migration that is extremely high levels and um, not as high as the UK or not as high as the US rather. Um, but we are seeing uh, literally over a million people a year. And bear in mind that our population is is about a fifth of, of right. you know, the United States. So a million people moving into the UK and it's about 750,000 net. So there's 250,000 leave. Um, unfortunately, some of those leaving are actually our best and brightest. And um, they're going to the United States. They're going to Australia. So we're seeing a, a real you know, shift in terms of who we have here in this country. Um, and I, I really do think that this is an issue that Christians need to grapple with more thoughtfully. One of the, I mean, the, the passage that always gets trotted out is, you know, you shall not mistreat the foreigner uh, and the right. stranger among you. Treat them as one of your own. And, uh, and there's truth in that. Uh, of course there is. What that doesn't mean is, it, do, it doesn't mean that everybody gets to live in your country if they show up there. That, that is not what that is saying. Um, Nehemiah built a wall. God commanded that as a good thing. He was commissioned by the Lord to do it ultimately in, you know, in a providential way that you see there. Um, having a border was considered to be a blessing and uh, having a well-defended border that could distinguish between those who come in uh, who are, are of a positive benefit to the nation uh, and those who are not. Um, very much what we've seen in the UK uh, and and also in Ireland. So, so I'm in Northern Ireland. We're part of the United Kingdom. We have obviously very tight links with the Republic of Ireland as well, being on the same island. As we've seen that there has been a really aggressive move by the governments to bring in extraordinary numbers of people to the point that, that you know, recently just south of the border here, there was a, a little town of 200 people and they, by government fiat, decided they were going to import uh, 250 illegal migrants into that town. So they are not, so now the, the native Irish in that town are the minority. And, and it's just absurd. It, it, it's, it's really, really uh, wicked. Um, there, there's, there are a whole bunch of downsides to this. Uh, three, three that I think are important. Um, number one is, is just costs and particularly the cost of housing. The cost of housing in the UK is uh, absolutely exorbitant. Um, and, and it is exorbitant on a net sense. It's particularly exorbitant compared to wages. So it used to be that houses were about four to five times uh, an average um, household income in the UK, uh, either household income or annual salary. I can't remember which, but doesn't doesn't matter too much. Uh, you know, the, the, the proportion still uh, is true across um, what, whichever one of those it is. Um, and, and now it sits at about nine times that. So houses have become half as affordable. Most yeah. people who are not already on the property ladder in the UK will never own a home. Uh, that that they will never be able to do it. There is no feasible pathway for that to happen. And that's basic economics. It's basic supply and demand. You bring in that many people. You don't have enough homes for those people. We don't, we're actually a very densely populated country in the United Kingdom. Um, the, you know, the, the, the population density is high. So do we concrete over the countryside? That's, you know, I don't think that's a great solution. There may be some extra building required, but ultimately our population would have been stable. And instead, it's increased by 10 million people over the last, you know, 20 or so years. And uh, these are not people that are, are native uh, and they're 
you know, the, yeah. So, so, so that's one issue. Uh, another issue is culture. Um, you know, I, I so so take for instance, right? I, I I'm Northern Irish, proudly Northern Irish, love the Northern Irish people, uh, and think we're great fun. Um, if you took all 1.9 million of us, I think there are here, and you transported us into Iceland, which has a population of 200, 300,000, somewhere in there. And they hit. Iceland doesn't exist anymore. You know, right. Iceland is gone. Its culture is gone because you've just, you've just imported a different culture that's become a majority culture. And as much as I love the Northern Irish people, I think that'd be a really bad thing. I think it'd be unkind to the Icelandic people. Um, yeah. And and that's true anywhere. Um, so you see that you see that in the macro sense in the UK, where we very much have lost any cultural sense of who we are. Um, the British people are being told by their media and all you know their politicians that oh the Brits don't have a culture. Bear in mind, this is the country that started the industrial revolution. Uh, yeah. This is the country that has spread the gospel across the globe. This is the country whose language everybody speaks. As you said, you know, America is an offshoot of British culture very right. explicitly. Even even the story of Paul Revere uh, shouting, the British are coming. It isn't actually what, yeah. I think it was Paul Revere, if I'm right, uh, forgive me if my American history is off, but yeah. the British are coming, whoever went, well, went and said that. Yeah. He didn't actually say that because they viewed themselves as British. Uh, he talked about the redcoats coming, I think was actually right. the right term. Um, right. You know, they viewed themselves as we're actually fighting to continue British culture. That was that was the American view at the time of the revolution. And uh, all across the world, you see things like British suits. That that was a, that's a British style that has infiltrated, you know, the entire. So we have a, an extraordinary culture, um, but we're being told we have none. So on that macro level, culture really disintegrates. And then on the micro level, you see things like, uh, as you said, areas and cities really in the UK, where, um, including London itself, where the bright, white British are now a minority yeah. um, in, in the capital city of the United Kingdom. Um, you have areas in London where the street signs are in, uh, I believe it's Bangladeshi or Hindi, one of the two. Um, you know, that's, that, that, and, and that's because the people can't read the English street signs. This isn't just some nice thing. This is, they, 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 that's what they speak there. Yeah. Um, you have you have areas that are strongly Islamic. Um, I do think that Islamic, the Islamic side of this, is probably the most concerning to me um, as as a believer. You know where where you really do have aggressive Islamic uh, beliefs being propagated. You've got forty percent of British Muslims believing in Sharia law. You have British Muslims being more likely to have joined either ISIS or Al Nusra than the British Armed Forces. Yeah, and you know you've got cities that look like that. Um, this is why we see a lot of um, you know various various things going on, uh, a lot of knife crime and a lot of rape, grooming gangs, things like that. Um, that that has just never been part of British culture in this way. So you see that, and and then you see crime. Uh, crime, crime is another one that that comes with this, where where you bring in people, and interestingly, when you have a welfare state that pays people to live in the country, um, what you tend to get actually is not the best and brightest from elsewhere. You tend to get those that weren't doing great elsewhere and want a cushier life. Um, so we're not getting, you know, the sort of Abu Dhabi, Dubai, you know, right. oil genius uh, people from that culture, right? What we're yeah. getting is a lot of the ones that couldn't make it there, but we'll pay them to live here. Uh, and that brings with it criminality. Um, it brings with it, uh, you know, rising violent crime. It brings certain kinds of crimes, sexual crimes being being one that's a real concern. I mean, it seems like every day on the news, there's a child who is stabbed um, and we're never told who it's by. You yeah. never, you never hear, uh, and when you're not told, that means you already know who did it. Unfortunately, you know, That's if right. it was a white British person, we would know, yeah. uh, and instead we don't. Uh, and so, so this is a, a much more complex issue than just treat the foreigner uh, well. right. Um, and, and I say that, by the way, as someone, as so you say, you know, you like people. I'm married to a Bulgarian woman. 
Uh, I love people from elsewhere, you know. So she's uh, she's Latvian. She sounds Northern Irish, but she's Bulgarian, and you know she grew up there, and her family lived there. And uh, this is not some sort of blood and soil nationalism that's right. going on, right? This is right. just and she and, and 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 by the way, a lot of our wonderful, well assimilated migrants view it the exact same way. The reason they came here was for the culture and the values yeah. of this place. The fact that we had built a society that looked like that, uh, and they too actually don't like that where they move to is being destroyed. Um, one many of our wonderful migrants have moved back to where they're from because it's better there. A lot of we, you know, big Polish contingent here in the UK, a lot of them moving back to Poland. It's safer. Their economy is about to overtake ours, and uh, yeah. So so there's it's we we really yeah. do need as the church to think about this more um more deeply more biblically uh, and with correct biblical categories yes i i fully fully agree you know i think it's interesting too um going back you know you're talking about the the challenge specifically with islam um you know western law british law british tradition is a christian tradition um sharia law is incompatible with some of the inalienable rights that are granted to citizens because they recognize that women men created equal in the sight of God, rights uh, and privileges are off, uh, you know, offered in the same way, irrespective of someone's gender, their biological sex. Not so uh, in the case of Sharia law, um, you know, not so in the case of, of um, you know, uh, due process and how that takes place, right, in the court system and so on and so forth. So when dealing, uh, when dealing with certain uh, familial issues when dealing with issues of, um, you know, issues of rape and other things. Um, Islam has a much different way of handling that in an honor culture. Um, and, and all that, all that's to say, it's not to say that Muslims haven't immigrated to Western countries. They certainly have. But when you don't have a process of naturalization, if you don't actually have a process by which you're vetting people that you bring in, uh, <laughs> traditionally you brought in people they were in search of education. They might have gotten an education visa to come into the UK and they're going to go study at, at Cambridge or Oxford or whatever. And then they decide, I'm staying here. I'm going to apply for citizenship. Right. And so that wasn't that was the way, you know, things happened or somebody immigrates because of work or somebody immigrates because of a family tie or family connection, um, which whatever it may have been traditionally they would come in and, and there would be a process of naturalization, meaning you're going to recognize that you are now British. You're, you're, you're a member of the British society. You are a citizen, right? And all of those things, there was rights and responsibilities pertaining to citizenship. But it's not, and now it's not the case. When you, when you as you point out, if you're reposting signs in, in Bangladesh or in Hindu or Farsi even, I don't know if that's coming up, or Arabic mm-hmm. or whatever it might be, you're, you're all of a sudden you have a multicultural society that is untenable long-term. Um, one is going to dominate, have a hegemonic influence over the other. Um, and so right now there's this blurring where it becomes indistinguishable and then eventually there is a replacement at some point. And I think that'd be detrimental um, to, to British society. I'd say the same way with America. Um, you know, uh, secularists, um, blindly believe secularism works, that it's unrivaled. It's always worked this way. It's actually, that's not true. Secularism is a relatively new phenomena, um, in political philosophy for the longest time. Um, secularism was actually just a blase Christian term to refer to Christian society, Christian culture, Christian influence and heritage. You could be a member of any various denomination, and we called that secularism because when we offered a generic sort of civil prayer, we prayed to God or prayed to Jesus Christ. But that was secularism, actually. And more recently, secularism is actually just full-fledged pluralism, multiculturalism, atheism, um, anything but Christian. Uh, you know, um, yeah. it's actually just anything that the ACLU deems to be not a threat to them uh, in the United States. You know, the American Civil Liberties Union and whoever else, uh, some ACLU attorney. But actually, 
what they mean by that actually is just as long as it's not Christian, it's okay. Um, yeah. But that I, I'm not trying to be melodramatic. I'm not trying to be um, incendiary. I'm just for all practical intents and purposes, if you lose that fundamental sense of culture, heritage, language, common history, your your constitutional order will disintegrate before your very eyes. You have no one to uphold it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. No, absolutely. Um, I, I do think that this this idea of neutrality being possible is one that Christians need to dispose of very quickly because it very clearly is not the case. There is no such thing as um, a, a neutral moral framework. There is no moral framework that you can get to, which is the basis of law, also the basis of culture, the basis of human interaction is how should you treat other people. And you cannot, there, there's no such thing as some universally agreed upon secular version of that. Um, but, you know, what we thought was neutral was, in fact, as you said, it was just the, the lingering heritage of Christian worldview that we were all very agreed on, even people that didn't express any sort of Christian faith, actually, even those that explicitly denied Christian faith, um, still oh, held quick. to all the Christian trappings. Yeah. Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, Dawkins apparently now yeah. is is, uh, is apparently a Christian nationalist. Is I don't know devout, if you heard that. The uh, anyway. cultural Christian, yeah. Since 1971, Liberty University has had one mission, training champions for Christ. We've been at this for a while, and in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains, we have grown to be a global force. Today, Liberty runs over 100,000 students around the globe, studying across 15 colleges and schools, and among them, over 30,000 military students. Across 700 programs of study, we train as one, nurses, artists, business leaders of the future and today. Together, we work to give back through service trips, local community work, and over 500,000 volunteer hours per year. And we play just as hard as we study with 20 NCAA athletic programs and 40 club sports teams. So who are we? We are Liberty University, and we train champions for Christ. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's sad because you realize, it's like, well, yeah, you were, you were a key part of actually tearing this down, and uh, now, you're, now you're regretting it. And uh, rightly, you should. Um, but yeah, I, I think what we've seen very interestingly here in the UK and I don't think this will play out quite the same way in the States, at least not soon, because you don't have the same level of, of Islamic influence uh, other than in certain small pockets, Dearborn, Michigan, yeah. whatever it might be. Right. Uh, but we've seen that we have a, a, a hard left government and they, uh, like every hard left government, they came in promising a sort of center left. Uh, and, but, but if you know anything about Keir Starmer, who is the current prime minister, if you know anything about his history, he's a devout Trotskyite. Um, uh, uh, Pab uh, Pablo White, to be specific in terms of what branch of that that is. People can look into that for more detail. Um, but that side, that sort of hardcore atheistic side, ha has essentially formed a, a pact, uh, and it goes down intersectional lines, um, but it is a pact with Islam. Uh, and they've chosen the side of Islam over the side of the... British population and over the side of Christianity. Uh, I think it is very much an attack on Christianity. So what we are seeing here is we saw someone go to jail mm -hmm. uh, last week, I believe, it may have been the week before, for shouting who the F is Allah. I, I, I don't think that's necessarily wise uh, or, or, or particularly beneficial to the, to the uh, discussion, right? Right. Um, but nonetheless, uh, jail uh, it, it is a legal law. Blasphemy law. We have Islamic blasphemy laws here in the UK that are enforced by our left wing government. But if someone uh, says who who oh. who the blank is Jesus Christ, that that wouldn't matter. Right. Anything any anything perceived to be I mean, so so in contrast to that, for example, uh, on in the West End, which is the sort of Broadway of London, um, there is a a a, a a play that is played pretty much every night. Um, 
on the Book of Mormon. It's called the Book of Mormon. Now I get not a Mormon and not endorsing Mormonism, but it's perceived to be more Christian, and it rips the uh, the, the you know it, it's a play on on, uh, on Mormonism and it, it makes fun of them, right? That's what it right. does. Yeah, and uh, so so it is. If you had something like that about Islam, it would be not just it wouldn't just cause outrage amongst a sort of rather rather hostile Islamic community. The government would ban that and arrest those involved in making it. And, uh, you know, so, so, so that's what we've seen is that, um, neutrality is impossible and we're going to have that here in September. I've had a serious discussion with my wife about what happens if I go to jail. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not joking about that. That is on the cards. Um, because mm. there's certain things that I will probably say that as a Christian, I have to say about stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, that as of September will be considered Islamophobia, but it's, it's really just. Islamic blasphemy laws, wow. and uh, so so that's what you get. Uh, and I, I do think I do think that the secularists are making a mistake. Um, I, I think the sort of soft, uh, the soft gods uh, of secular liberalism will find themselves dominated by something stronger than that. I don't think they have enough weight to to actually hold uh, a society together. Um, if there's one thing that the Islamic community does have, it's a very strong sense of community identity and of culture and of history. And that is why they probably carry a disproportionate amount of cultural weight uh, yeah. and can shift the culture, despite still being a relatively small, you know, it's about six, seven percent of the British population now is Muslim. That's doubled in a decade, by the way. So we're headed in a, in a direction where that could be the majority by 2050 if it continues. Um, but but nonetheless, um, yeah, the, the, anybody that thinks you can keep neutrality will find out very quickly that you can't. So, you know, it's kind of, I was having a conversation, former congressman, um, you know, not too long ago. And I said, you know, what what do you get when you mix Christianity and secularism together? Uh, in this, and this is based on the last fifty years. What what do you get? You know, like, what do you? I don't know. What do you get? I get you get secularism. You Christianity secularism mix them together. You get secularism. Well, what do you get when you mix um, secularism and Islam together? And I don't know. What what do you get? You get Islam, because yeah. Islam will never forfeit. Uh, ultimately, this is it, it, jihad is integral to the Islamic faith. Uh, anyone who, who tells you otherwise is not truly being honest about the Quran. Uh, or the aims and ambitions of of Islam. Now, and and the Bible has a tell us too. There's a teleological argument. It's the kingdom of God, um, but who ushers in the kingdom? I mean, the ultimate thing is we don't crusade and usher in the kingdom. Islam is dependent upon the proponents of the faith um, by sword ushering in the kingdom. We do it by preaching the gospel once for all delivered to the saints. We preach the truth of God's word. And the kingdom is ushered in by the spirit of God, converting the hearts of men and women. There, that's the key fundamental difference. But in in the weakness of Christianity and sort of the cultural malaise over the past fifty years, Christianity continues to forfeit and punt to secularists. Uh, we fold like a cheap wet blanket. But when you when jihad uh, jihadists are coming into a country, they have a long game. It's teleological. Uh, it's integral. Um, and ultimately, there is a holy war being committed, um, and 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 eventually it arises to the point where it's true kinetic war uh, and warfare. Um, but the secularists, I believe, the cultural Marxists are the political clowns that are allowing room for the jihadists to come in, and they're even willing to police, um, you know, the British citizens and whatnot. Um, the, you know, those, those who are. I, to be, for lack of a better word, more native to the culture, they're willing to police mm -hmm. their own in order to make room under the guise of cultural Marxism when in fact they're being utilized as pawns um, by by the very uh, folks who want to ultimately uh, take over society, uh, take over British culture. Yeah, I mean, Gettysburg Gaza is is a, an interesting example of this, right? Yes. I mean, how, how, how well are they treated in Gaza? Not very, um, but nonetheless, the, it, it is it's the useful idiot class, if. and um, it it will it will destroy itself. Um, yeah, secularism secularism cannot continue. Uh, I don't think secularism will have the legs of something like Islam. You know, Islam has been around for 
uh, 1400 years or, or whatever it might be coming up on that. Right. And, uh, I don't think secularism can last anywhere near that long. We've had a couple of hundred years of attempts at secularism really since the French Revolution. That uh, was the first serious effort. Um, I don't think in, in another 1200 years anybody's going to be doing that anymore should we still be here, um, depending, depending on people's eschatological positions, right? Uh, but but um, yeah, it, it doesn't have uh, a ballast to it. It doesn't have a foundation. It's, it explicitly says we don't have a foundation, which means that you ultimately end up just adopting another one. Right. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, so I, I, I want to, you're a pastor. Um, hey. you, you, you've taken it upon yourself to found, found this, this media company specifically for Christians. Um, you're dealing with, you know, um, news items of the day. Um, it's clear that there's a, there's a breakdown in, in, in Christian media that we're seeing. So for, in your own words, in your own opinion, why is it so important then, you know, in light of what we're seeing, um, uh, the erosion of the Christian faith, um, Christian history, all of that in society, common understanding, common vernacular. Um, it's hard to, it's difficult sometimes now to have a conversation with somebody um, in America or in the UK. If they didn't grow up in church, they have no reference point whatsoever. Um, so it's almost like you're starting from scratch. Why is it so important that Christians now be bold to be a voice for truth in the public square? Yeah. Uh, well, I think we got here because we stopped doing that. I think that's that's part of the big reason. You know, I'm a big believer in, I mean, obviously we're all believers in this. This is nothing, yeah. not something that it should be uh, uh, controversial, right? But we are the salt of, of the, the earth and... One of the things that that means, Jesus in that moment when he says, you are the salt of the earth, is actually not telling the church to do something. Um, he's talking about this, a state of order. He's talking about a state of, of um, as you use the word, tell us how God has created the world. Um, he tells the church to do something just after that, which is maintain your savor or you'll be trampled underfoot. But he, when he says you are the salt of the earth, what he's saying is actually you do influence the world around you. You are the influence for good in this world. And and I think where you see a world that is losing its savor, when you see a nation like in the UK, where that it used to be the epicenter of Christianity. It used to be the nation that was sending out missionaries across the globe, writing the books that everybody was reading, all the great theology, you know, was was done here. Um for for a good period anyway, and you see that it's very much not like that. You have to say that the church does have responsibility for that. Uh -huh. that the church, you know, and, and that's not to say that the culture can't, you know, throw in some curveballs every now and then. You can't meet, meet, you know, meet some challenges. But ultimately, if we maintain our savor, the world will be salted. Like that's yeah, that's, that's 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 how I believe it's set up. And uh, and so I think we stopped doing that. You know, if I look at the church here in the UK um, and I compare it to the church in the States, I I'm really concerned. Um, I think the church in the States has a lot more pushback on these issues. I'm actually hopeful. Um, having been there, we met, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, out in, in Florida not too long ago. Or just, or yeah, yeah, month, that's right. Whatever it was. And, you know, at a conference and you see that there are believers and, and I met a whole bunch of others. I was doing a couple of different stops and um, you couldn't in a million years have anything like that in the UK. If we had a conference like that here, we'd have six people, you know, we could do it in my bedroom. Uh, that's that's the reality. Um, the Christians here have caved on these issues. They've decided either really to uh, be silent, sort of go the pietistic will not engage route or the full-blown compromise and um, most Christians in the UK are left-wing and will vote for the Labour Party which is our Democratic Party um, equivalent and uh, you know so so, so I, I, the way I see it is I, there was a while I, I grew up in, in a context where I was more much more willing and interested in being neutral and sort of you know we'll try and you know I'll, I'll you know we'll try try and convince people but we'll not we'll not push it too far and there just came a moment where I realized actually in the church that I was in that this was destroying it. And then I see the direction of the culture and it's destroying there too. And we just need to take the gloves off. Like it's last chance saloon. 
as far as I'm concerned, for the UK. If we don't have a revival uh, and a move of God soon, which will require boldness from the church, it will require us to speak up. Um, yeah. Then, then it, that is the end of the nation. The, 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 the nation will not exist in another generation's time, not not in any meaningful sense. You could have it on a map and it might have the same name, but, but everything that it stood for will have gone. So uh, if we're not going to do it now, uh, we're we're not going to have another chance. We need to do it. I mean, to do it soon. You know, I I love what you say. You know, if you're going to have a nation, right? It really is Christians who have to stand up, and that's the irony of the whole thing, right? Um, Christians are not. It, it's not a globalist movement, and globalism is not Great Commission. Globalism is this kind of irrespective and you know dis, you know indistinguishable, uh, like a babel kind of understanding right out of Genesis, you know, that's yeah. globalism. But it, it, what's interesting is that if if the UK is to be saved, if America's to be saved, um, the nation must repent and turn back to Christ. Um, not only will it found the, f- find the roots and the fundaments of what gave rise to the nation in the first place, but it will it will find its soul. I mean, that's the that's the thing. Um, you know, we we have so much confusion today over what it means to be a Christian. You were just pointing out, I think that's so, that was so foreign to the United States for such a long time until more recently, this rise of sort of progressive Christianity, leftist Christianity. Right. But this idea of of Christians voting uh, for, for radical candidates um, that are left-leaning and have these policies that are, that are breaking down society, how could they support that? And it's just a, it's a faith divorced from the scriptures is severed from yep. any notion of truth. It's really a feelings-based, compassion-based kind of thing. It's not really the Christian faith. Um, it, it's it's some kind of a cultural amalg- amalgamation. In China, when Mao Zedong took over um, and you had a communist government, um, there was the Three Self Church that immediately endorsed the Communist Manifesto. So if you say, is there a Christian church in, in China? They would say, absolutely. There's a state-sanctioned church um, that has that celebrated, for example, the 100-year anniversary of communism uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, they are completely in the, that's their version, by the way, of Christian nationalism. Right. Uh, it's this kind of faith that supports the regime and, um, I would say there's a Christian nationalism in the United States that supports leftist policies, that supports uh, anything that the that those in power might say. Uh, they're not really upholding and affirming the word of God, the inerrant truth of God's word. Um, it's not about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not about the doctrinal distinctives. It's not about any of that. It's just about affirming um, the status quo politically. Uh, so even in China, they have Christian bookstores uh, where you can go into a bookstore and get John Piper's Desiring God, for example. Eek. I don't know that for for a fact if right. it's that, but it's any number of Christian books that you would find in the United States. You can't find, however, any Christian books that are really, and they might be individual and they might be hyper-spiritual, pietistic kind of books about prayer and worship and things like that, but you won't find books uh, in their biographies and histories about Christians who changed the world, uh, Christians that helped to found nations, Christians that were were patriots and involved in some kind of a political struggle. You're not going to find a book about Bonhoeffer in a Chinese right. bookstore. That's what they don't want you to have. They're totally fine with uh, pietistic spirituality. Uh, they're totally fine. They're not threatened by any of that. Um, so, I think it's important that as we speak as Christians, we differentiate the true faith from the the cultural nonsense and the noise that you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, it is at that point of conflict, I think, as well, where Christianity does distinguish itself, at least faithful Christianity. Um, you know, w- we often imagine that the saints in the early church, you know, were persecuted just because the Romans didn't like Christians. I just didn't like them and decided to to throw them to the lions or whatever. But but that wasn't it at all. You know, the reason, I'm sure you knew this, but maybe the audience might not be aware or some won't anyway. Uh, The reason was that they wouldn't, they wouldn't, um, you know, go with the party line as it pertained to their faith so that they were asked to offer a pinch of incense and say, Kaiser Curios, uh, Caesar is Lord. 
And they said, no, we can't do that. We can't compromise on this issue. And so they were they were persecuted, not just because they were Christians and had a different sort of religious worldview. They, they were persecuted as political dissidents because their faith commanded them to apply itself uh, and to apply their faithfulness to these areas and to these issues. Uh, and I think a lot of Christians in our day, um, uh, and I think the Church of England is an excellent example of this, and there's been multiple reports of how the government has pressured the Church of England, which is our state church here in the UK, uh, or in England rather, but, but uh, you know, uh, the United Kingdom as a whole, um, they, they uh, have pressured them on the issue of gay marriage. And, you know, they've, they've been very clear that we're going to, you know, really push back against you if you don't get on board with this. And so they've done so. And, mm -hmm. you know, to not do so would be political. And you go, oh, right. Uh, you know, so, so that is actually, it is essential that the church doesn't confine its faith just to your little devotional life and your little walk with God. If it doesn't actually stand uh, for truth in the public square, then it's not really standing for truth. Mm. Amen. Well said. Jamie Bambrick, I really appreciate all you're doing over at Clear Truth Media. By the way, where do we find this stuff? These articles? Yeah, Clear Truth. Yeah, ClearTruthMedia.com. That's the place to go. And um, we're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I think we just started an Instagram as well. We did just start an Instagram. We haven't got much up there. There's stuff coming soon. So, but Facebook That's awesome. uh, and Twitter and ClearTruthMedia.com. We're going to clip some of this and we're going to put it on Instagram. Okay. So we'll, nice. we'll help feed your sure. account. So that'd be awesome. Nice. Hope I'll Church Craigaven. Craig Craigavon. Craig 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 yeah. Craig Good job. Okay. Wonderful. Editor-in-Chief of Clear Truth Media, Associate Pastor of Hope Church, Craig Avon. Jamie Bambrick, thank you for joining the Give Me Liberty podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great to be with him. Hey, did you find this helpful? I hope you did. Please like and subscribe, share with a friend, and also go to standingforfreedom.com where you can find more content, articles, podcasts, and our Theology of Politics series all at standingforfreedom.com.